Hello. Um, this is part two of The Great Gatsby. I am having to turn on a flashlight. Give me just a second so that I can um, see a little bit better. Okay, when we left, um, Nick was at the Buchanan's house on East Egg, um, and he was uh, eating dinner. You remember Daisy is his cousin and Tom he had gone to school with, so he knew a little bit. Um, he meets Jordan and um, for the first time and kind of has a different type of, um, she has a different type of response to him. He She's not very friendly and, and outgoing. She doesn't even really look at him. Um, and she's kind of has her nose stuck up like this. But throughout dinner, she and Daisy talk. Um, the phone rings and they go out and get it. And um, or the butler does. Um, anyway, we come to find out that Jordan, who is Daisy's friend, knows that um, her husband, Tom, is cheating on her. And it's kind of a well-known secret, except Nick obviously didn't know it because, you know, he's just gotten there. So we're going to start um, part two, which is called Tom's Secret. And it's going to be on my page 15. Daisy has just come back to the, um, to the table and she has just said, it couldn't be helped cried Daisy with tense gaiety. She sat down, glanced searchingly at Miss Baker and then at me and continued. I looked out outdoors for a minute and it's very romantic outdoors. There's um, a burr on the lawn and I think it must be a nightingale come over on the Cunard or White Star Line. He's singing away. Her voice sang, it's romantic, isn't it, Tom? Very romantic, he said. And then miserably to me, it's, if it's light enough after dinner, I want to take you down to show you the stables. Remember, he's very proud of what he has. He wants to show off his wealth. The telephone rang inside. Uh, the telephone rang inside startlingly. And as Daisy shook her head decisively at Tom, the subject of the stables, in fact, all subjects, vanished in thin air. So when she, they say that she shook her head decisively, decisively means like there's a decision being made. It rings again. Daisy looks at her husband and gives up, like, do not answer that phone. Among the broken fragments of the last five minutes at table, I remember the candles being lit again, pointlessly, and I was conscious of wanting to look squarely at everyone and yet to avoid all eyes. I couldn't guess what Tom and Daisy were thinking, but I doubt if even Miss Baker, who seemed to have mastered a certain hearty skepticism, was able utterly to put the to put this fifth guess shrill uh, metallic urgency out of mind. It, to a certain temperament, the situation might've seemed intriguing. My own instinct was to telephone immediately for the police. So Tom is feeling really awkward, okay? He's just found out the secret about his cousin. Um, they don't know that he knows the secret. That's probably the mistress calling he sees Daisy look at Tom and tell him not to get it. And everybody's just kind of, so he's, some people like this. That's what he says. Some people might find it intriguing and they might like the idea of, you know, like, you know, spilling the tea and looking for stuff, but he doesn't, he doesn't really know what to do. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I got interrupted. Um, the horses, needless to say, were not mentioned again. Tom and Miss Baker, with several feet of twilight between them, strolled back into the library as if to a vigil beside a perfectly tangible body while trying to look pleasantly interested and a little deaf. I followed Daisy around a chain of connecting verandas to the porch in front. In its deep gloom, we sat down side by side. Daisy took her face in her hands as if feeling its lovely shape and her eyes moved gradually out to the velvet dusk. I saw that turbulent emotions possessed her. So I asked what I thought would be some sedative questions about her little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly, even if we are cousins. You didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. That's true. She hesitated. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had reason to be. So I'm going to stop right here, and I want you to make sure that you um, write in the margin, why is she cynical? What has made her 
um, cynical. He says, evidently she had reason to be. And cynical means not trusting, um, just assuming that people are going to be bad and people are going to, um, you know, lie or cheat. So in my book, I wrote, it's because of Tom, you know, having the affair. If you know your husband is having an affair, which she, it seems like she does at this point, she's going to be cynical. So right in that margin, evidently she had reason to be, and I wrote Tom's affair. I waited, but she didn't say any more. And after a moment, I returned rather feebly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything? Oh, yes. She looked at me absently. Listen, Nick, let me tell you when I what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear it? Very much. It'll show you how I've gotten to feel about things. Well, she was less than an hour old and Tom was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling and asked the nurse right away if it was a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl. And so I turned my head away and I wept. All right, I said, I'm glad it's a girl and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. I need you to underline what she um, says. I'm going to go back and reread that. I'm glad it's a girl, and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. I need you to understand what that means. Um, and so I'm going to try without, you know, having the, the back and forth discussion um, to explain it. Um, Daisy's not a fool. Okay. She knows what's happening. And because of her knowing she's unhappy, um, she hopes that if her little girl doesn't, she hopes she doesn't really realize certain things like how men are going to treat her and how her life is going to be, because if she doesn't realize it, then she'll always be happy. So I want you to ask yourself, would you rather know that, um, you know, something someone is lying to you or someone is cheating on you um, and be unhappy or right. Or would you rather not know and be happy? Okay. So she would prefer her daughter just not know. Okay. And it's kind of a sad um, way to see things. She's assuming that because her husband cheats on her, that her daughter's husband is going to cheat. Um, that's kind of the way her life has, has been. You see, I think everything's terrible anyhow, she went on in a convinced way. Everybody thinks so, the most advanced people, and I know. I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Her eyes flashed around her in a defiant way, rather like Tom's, and she laughed with thrilling scorn, sophisticated. God, I'm sophisticated. The instant her voice broke off, ceasing to compel my attention, my belief. I felt the basic insincerity of what she said. It made me uneasy as though the whole evening had been a trick of some sort to exact a contributory emotion from me. I waited and sure enough, in a moment, she looked at me with an absolute smirk on her lovely face as if she had asserted her membership in a rather distinguished secret society to which she and Tom belonged. So just when Nick is kind of seeing a different side of his um, his cousin who before just seemed kind of um, superficial just on the surface. She's kind of letting, you know, her thoughts out and she's letting um, how she feels about, you know, life. But it's almost like she realizes it. She's giving too much truth and she pulls back and she pretends that, um, you know, that, oh, you know, it was just a joke or she doesn't say it, but that's kind of the feeling he gets. So now he's like, is she being truthful then or is she being truthful now? So there's not a real um, depth to Daisy as of yet. Nick doesn't see it. And she does definitely share, um, I underlined in the, um, the paragraph, you see, I think everything's terrible anyhow. That's very pessimistic that she doesn't have hope. She doesn't have, um, you know, this idea that um, things are going to get better. Inside the crimson room bl bloomed with light. Tom and Miss Baker sat at either end of the long couch and she read aloud to him from the Saturday Evening Post. The words, murmurous and uninflected, running together in a soothing tone. The lamplight, 
bright on his boots and dull on the autumn leaf yellow of her hair, glinted along the paper as she turned the page with a flutter of uh, slender muscle in her arms. When we came in, she held us silent for a moment with a lifted hand. To be continued, she said, uh, tossing the magazine on the table in our very next issue. Her body asserted itself with a restless movement of her knee and she stood up. Mm, 10 o'clock, she remarked, apparently finding the time on the ceiling. Time for this good girl to go to bed. Jordan's gonna play in tomorrow's tournament, explained Daisy, over at Westchester. Oh, you're Jordan Baker. I knew now why her face was familiar. Its pleasing, contemptuous expression had looked out at me from many, um, I'm gonna do my best at saying this, Rota, Rotogravier, these are like magazines, um, pictures of the sporting life at Asheville and Hot Springs and Palm Beach. I had heard some story of her too, a critical, unpleasant story, but what it was, I had forgotten long ago. So now I would um, highlight that previous paragraph right there. This is a description of Jordan Baker. Um, talks about how he knows her, where he's seen her from. She's been in um, Sporting Magazine. She's a professional golfer. And so we've talked about this new woman who can have her own life and who can have her own um, career. This is one of those women. She's single and she can kind of, you know, do what she wants. And just, you know, five years before this, it really wasn't possible for young women to do this. Um, and so I would highlight that and um, make sure that you know that Jordan is a golfer. And this is kind of a um, description of her. And also he says, um, and this is going to become important later. He remembers something about her, like that was said about her, but he can't really put his finger on it. Okay, so this is when he first meets her. He kind of thinks of something, but it doesn't. He doesn't put two and two together yet. Good night, she said softly. Wake me at eight, won't you? If you'll get up, I will. Good night, Mister Caraway. See you anon. Oh, of course you will. Confirmed Daisy. In fact, I think I'll arrange a marriage. Come over often, Nick, and I'll sort of oh fling you together. You know, lock you up accidentally in linen closets and and push you out to to see in the boat and, and all that sort of thing. Good night, called Miss Baker from the stairs. I haven't heard a word. She's a nice girl, said Tom after a moment. They oughtn't to let her run around this country, the country this way. Who oughtn't? Inquired Daisy coldly. Her family. Her family is one aunt about a thousand years old. Besides, Nick's going to look after her, aren't you, Nick? She's going to spend lots of weekends out here in the summer. Um, I think the, the home influence will be very good for her. Okay, so um, before we move on, the fact that Tom um, kind of makes a remark about her, um, you know, and people watching her and not letting her do things, um, this is sort of like we've come to understand he's a little bit racist. Now we're finding out that he's a little bit sexist. Okay, so right that he, his remark right here, um, they oughtn't to let her run around the country this way. That's a little sexist. Um, and you're going to be asked about that in your part. So I would mark that. Daisy and Tom looked at each other for a moment in silence. Is she from New York? I asked quickly. From Louisville. Our white girlhood was passed together there. Our beautiful white. Did you give Nick a little heart to heart talk on the veranda? Demanded Tom suddenly. Did I? She looked at me. I can't seem to remember, but I think we talked about the Nordic race. Yes, I'm sure we did. It sort of crept up on us. And the first thing you know, don't believe everything you hear, Nick, he advised me. So again, this is showing he's cutting his wife off. Like he's um, not really taking her seriously. And she's teasing him, you know, because they talked about the Nordic race and that kind of thing. And, and she's just kind of like, oh, I can't remember what we talked about. And she's being, but he's still not being very kind to her and letting her speak. Um, I said lightly that I had heard nothing at all, and a few minutes later, I got up to go home. They came to the door with me and stood side by side in a cheerful square of light. As I started my motor, Daisy preemptorily recalled, called, wait, I forgot to ask you something, and it's important. We heard you were engaged to a girl out west. That's right, corroborated Tom kindly. We heard that you were engaged. It's libel. I'm too poor. But we heard it insisted Daisy, surprising me by opening up again in a flower-like way. We heard it from three people, so it must be true. 
Of course, I knew what they were referring to, but I wasn't even vaguely engaged. The fact that Gossip had published the bands was one of the reasons I had come east. You can't stop going with an old friend on account of rumors. And on the other hand, I had no intention of being rumored into marriage. Highlight or underline that last um, sentence. Basically, um, he was talking to someone um, back home. It wasn't very serious for him, but everybody was, you know, talking about it. And he he was kind of caught. He he knew that he wasn't supposed to marry her, but he um, he didn't want to just stop because I was talking about it. But then on the other hand, he's not going to be, you know, forced by rumors into um, marrying someone. So there was a girl that he was talking to. However, it was not serious. And um, but you can tell that it even reached, you know, to New York through the family that he was seeing someone. Their interests rather touched me and made them less remotely rich. Nevertheless, I was confused and a little disgusted as I drove away. It seemed to me that the thing for a parent. No, I got to start over. It seemed to me that the thing for Daisy to do was to rush out of the house child in arms, but apparently there was no such intentions in her head. As for Tom, the fact that he had some woman in New York was really less surprising than that he had been depressed by a book. Something was making him nibble at the edge of stale ideas of his sturdy physical egotism no longer nourished his preemptor preemptory heart. So he's leaving I mean, she, he, and he just kind of like, ah, these people, they're not very, they don't have a lot of depth. And you're going to find that the the rich people, they they don't. They just kind of rely in the book. They kind of rely on their money. Um, she mentions the child, but yet he never sees it. And that's, that's his relation. So does it seem like she is a very, um, like, hands-on mom? Probably not. Already, it was deep summer on the roadhouse roofs. And in the front of the wayward garages were new red gas pumps um, set out in the pools of light. And when I reached my estate at West Egg, I ran the car under the shed and sat for a while on the abandoned gas roller in the yard. The wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night with wings beating on the trees and a persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew the frogs full of life. The silhouette of a moving cat wavered in the moonlight and turning my head um, to watch it, I saw that I was not alone. 50 feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's mansion and was standing with his hands in his pockets regarding the silver pepper of the stars. Something in his leisurely movements um, and the secure position of his feet upon the lawn suggested that it was Mr. Gatsby himself come out to determine what share of our local heavens was his. So right here, you're gonna get another description of Gatsby. Okay, so write that in the um, the margin. Um, it says that a fig start with a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's lawn. He was standing with his hands in his pockets, regarding, kind of looking out into the um, the the water. Um, it says he has a leisurely movements. Um, so he realizes that this must be this Gatsby, and he's not met him before. Um, and during this time, it was um, you didn't just you know how you could just walk up to someone and be like, oh, you know, I heard that you were. Um, you know, Ms. Condra, you taught at the academy. This really wasn't like um, a mannerly thing to do. Um, and so, but he goes on to say that because Ms. Baker had mentioned him, maybe he could use that as like an introduction. I decided to call to him. Ms. Baker had mentioned him at dinner and that would do for an introduction, but I didn't call to him for he gave a sudden intimation that he was content to be alone. He stretched out his arms toward the dark water in a curious way. And as far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily, I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except a single green light, minute and far away, that might have been at the end of a dock. When I looked away once more, when I looked once more uh, for Gatsby, he had vanished and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. Okay, so right here, um, I need you to note what he's doing. He's kind of stretching out to the um, to this green light. And Nick doesn't know what the green light is. He doesn't know why he'd be stretching out to this green light, but it stops him from 
um, from going up and bothering him. He doesn't want to, to be in his way. Um, I need you to mark that this is the first that we see that this green light is going to, you know, be somewhat symbolic um, of, you know, what's going to happen in the book. Okay. And that is the end of chapter one, but not the end of part two. Okay. So we're going to continue on. On the top of part two, I need you to write um, the Valley of Ashes. Okay. Um, and I'm going to walk and let the puppy out and just right over here. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so I want you to write the Valley of Ashes. This is gonna be um, another part of the map and it's gonna be another part of some symbolism that you're gonna to need to know. About halfway between West Egg um, and New York, the motor road hastily joins the railroad and runs back for a quarter of a mile so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a Valley of Ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat into ridges and hills and grotesque gardens where ashes take the form of houses and chimneys and rising smoke. And finally, with a transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of cars crawls along the invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak and comes to rest. And immediately the gray ash men swarm up with their um, lean in spades and sit up and stir up and in, in per, uh, imper basically you can't see through it that's what it means cloud which screens their obscure operations from your sight okay so on our map okay it's gonna blur it so um you're just gonna have to um look at it Basically, to get from um, West Egg and East Egg, you have to go through this place that and it has a railroad um, track. You can drive on it, but it also has a railroad track, and you have to go through. And all through this, it's a really um, a it's a poverty stricken place. There's not a lot of businesses. The people who live there are um, are maybe like working for dimes and things like that. It has kind of a um, obviously ashes don't grow, but everything's kind of covered in ash and it's just kind of dirty. Um, there's kids there that are maybe begging for food. Um, basically, though, you have to go, the rich people from East and West Egg have to travel through this kind of um, dumpy place, this poor place to get to New York City. Okay, and it's going to become symbolic. Well, this is what this whole area right here where it has some businesses and it has, you know, cars. This is the, the Valley of Ashes. Um, but below the gray land um, and the spasms of bleak, dust which drift endlessly over it, you perceive, after a moment, the eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. The eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead from a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Okay, so we talked about um, Dr. T.J. Eckelberg um, as one of the, the symbols in here or the themes. Um, basically, it's a billboard, okay, in this Valley of Ashes, um, a huge billboard, and it used to have more of a clear um, face, but now you can barely, you can just see the eyes, and they have glasses, okay? What it was is Dr. T.J. Eckelberg, Eckelberg used to be an eye doctor, um, and either he moved away or he just never fixed the sign. But basically, it looks like these eyes um, are like watching over everything that happens in the um, because the billboard is so high um, in the Valley of Ashes. OK, so keep this in mind. There's not an actual Dr. T.J. Eckelberg. It is a billboard with just the eyes. Um, I underlined that part um, about Dr. T.J. Eckelberg and I wrote beside that it's a billboard. So you might want to add that too. Um, uh, evidently, 
some wild wag of an oculist, an eye doctor, set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens and then sank down himself into eternal blindness or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes, dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brewed on over the solemn dumping ground. And so the fact that the Valley of Ashes is described as a solemn dumping ground, it just shows you it's not a real happy place. It's just kind of gray and um, people are, you know, not doing real well, like financially, that kind of thing. This next paragraph um, continues to explain and describe the Valley of Ashes. So I've underlined it um, and put on the side more description of the Valley of Ashes. The Valley of Ashes is bounded on one side by a small foul river. And when the drawbridge is up um, to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute. And it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. Okay, so if you are from North Myrtle Beach or Soxy, you know about the um, the bridge, right? When the bridge turns, well, this is kind of like that, but it's a it's a drawbridge, and so they have to you know hold it up for um, barges to go through. So sometimes the people that are the rich people that are commuting, they are just kind of stuck in the Valley of Ashes, like looking around, and they kind of have to, you know, um, kind of see this this dumping ground. Well, they were on it one day, and this is how, um, you know, Nick comes to meet Tom's mistress. Now, please remember, as weird as this is, Daisy, who is Tom's wife, is Nick's cousin, okay? So it's really inappropriate to take, you know, your wife's cousin to meet your girlfriend, um, but again, um, he was, Tom's not the most stand-up guy, and he definitely has, you um, uh, some rather not very likable qualities, and we're going to find out some more. The fact that he had one, a mistress, was insisted upon wherever he was known. His acquaintances resented the fact that he turned up in popular restaurants with her and, leaving her at a table, sauntered about, chatting with whomever he knew. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her, but I did. I went up to New York with Tom on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet, taking hold of my elbow, literally forcing me out of the car. We're getting off, he insisted. I want you to meet my girl. So again, people know about his um, affair with this woman. He takes her to places, you know, that maybe people that know his wife. And so it's kind of, it's super tacky. It's not even kind of tacky, it's super tacky. Um, but like he will, um, so it's been going on a while and he will, you know, take her to a restaurant and then, um, leave her at the table and then go around and like work the room. Okay. Really arrogant. Um, I think he had tanked up a good deal at luncheon and his determination to have my company bordered on violence. He was a little tipsy. They had had some something to drink. The supercilious assumption was that on Sunday afternoon, I had nothing better to do. I followed him over the high whitewashed railroad fence and we walked back a hundred yards along the road under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. The only building in sight was a small block of yellow brick sitting on the edge of a wasteland, a sort of compact main street ministering, um, ministering to it and contiguous to absolutely nothing. One of the three shops it contained um, was for rent. Another was an all night restaurant approached um, by a trail of ashes. The third was a garage. Repairs. George B. Wilson. Cars bought and sold. I followed Tom inside. And so um, on the map, it's labeled where, um, where on the, through the Valley of Ashes, where this man, Tom Wilson lives. He owns the garage. It's kind of, he's a mechanic, that kind of garage. Um, and he has gas. They had pumps out there and stuff. Um, but so that's where Tom takes Nick in. The interior was unprosperous and bare. The only car visible was the dust-covered wreck of a Ford, which crouched in a dim corner. It occurred to me that this shadow of a garage must be a blind, and that sumptuous and romantic apartments were concealed overhead. So, um, stop right there just for a second. He kind of thinks, ooh, well, maybe this is like one of those speakeasies, you know, like it looks bad on the outside, but like there's really nice places upstairs. But when he sees this guy, George, his mind changes. 
Um, when the proprietor himself appeared at the door of an office, wiping his hands on a piece of waste. Um, he was a blonde, spiritless man, anemic and faintly handsome. When he saw us, a damp gleam of hope sprang into his light blue eyes. So mark that and write that this is a description of George. Um, this is George Wilson, um, blonde and spiritless. What do you think of when you think of spiritless? Definitely not someone who like walks out and is like, hey, you guys, how you doing? It's just that he kind of, he's there. Um, and if I have any pre-med majors, um, anemic is when you don't have um, enough iron, but you're really pale and you just look, if, you, if you're if you severely anemic, then, you know, it, obviously there's different stages, but you just look sick. Okay. So he's not, he's somewhat handsome. Like maybe he used to be handsome at the time, but he's definitely not feeling very like, you know, energetic right now. But when he sees Tom, he kind of, you know, perks up a little bit. Hello, Wilson, old man, said Tom, slapping him jovially on the shoulder. How's business? I can't complain, answered Wilson unconvincingly. When are you going to sell me that car? Next week. I've got my man working on it now. Works pretty slow, don't he? No, he doesn't, said Tom coldly. And if you feel that way about it, maybe I'd better sell it somewhere else after all. I, I, I didn't mean that, explained Wilson quickly. I, I just meant... His voice faded off and Tom glanced impatiently around the garage. Then I heard footsteps on the stairs. And in a moment, the thickish figure of a woman blocked out the light from the front from the office door. She was in the middle 30s and faintly stout, but she carried her surplus flesh sensuously as some women can. Her face above a spotted dress of dark blue Crepe de Chine, contained a and contained no facet or gleam of beauty, but there was an immediate perceptible vitality about her, as if the nerves of her body were, were continually smoldering. Okay, so mark that where it starts with the thickish figure of a woman. This is the description of Tom's wife, Myrtle. Okay, um, and the only way I can, because it he describes her in a way that you don't look at her like Daisy, you knew was beautiful. You knew that she just had this way about her um, just by looking at her. Myrtle doesn't have that. First, she's a little, um, she's voluptuous, which means she's not like, you know, tiny little thin picks, you know, slip of woman. I think of like um, a woman that's shaped like Beyonce, you know, she's tall and she's got curves. That's Myrtle. Okay. Um, she's not necessarily attractive, Yet there's something about her that makes her attractive. She has a confidence that she kind of, and like I said, she smolders, okay? Um, so I love that, you know, first of all, he says her thickish figure. It's a nice way of saying, you know, she's not super thin. But then it says um, she carried her surplus flesh sensuously as some women can. So clearly she's got more meat on her bones, but she works it. Okay, so this is Myrtle. Write that in your um, in your margin. So she walks um, down or she starts down the steps. She smiled slowly and walking through her husband as if he were a ghost, shook hands with Tom, looking him flush in the eye. Then she wet her lips and without turning around to speak, no, sorry. Then she wet her lips and without turning around, spoke to her husband in a soft, coarse voice. Get some chairs, why don't you? So somebody can sit down. So talk about nerve, okay? This is Tom's mistress, in case you haven't figured it out. She walks right past her husband in this man's home, his business, goes right to Tom, looks him square in the face. Remember, women weren't um, really taught to do this. Um, shakes his hand and then kind of, you know, in an offhand remark, get some chairs. Oh, sure agreed Wilson hurriedly and went toward the little office, mingling immediate with the cement color of the walls. The white ashen dust veiled his dark suit and his pale hair as it veiled everything in the vicinity, except his wife who moved closer to Tom. I want to see you, said Tom intently. Get on the next train. All right, I'll meet you by the newsstand over the lower level. 
She nodded and moved away from him, just as George Wilson emerged with two chairs from his office door. So, I mean, they make this, this meet. She, he goes, you know, into her place of business. Now, you have to look at this relationship, too. You're going to learn more about this. But Tom is ridiculously wealthy, has more money than he knows what to do with. He is, you know, having an affair. His mistress is dirt poor. She lives in the Valley of Ashes. Um, her husband is just trying to make ends meet. Literally, she lives over a garage. Okay, so you've heard of people when they say that, oh, you know, he's slumming it. Yeah, she could not be more opposite of his wife. Okay, and when she, he says, I want to see you, she's like, yep, right away. <clears throat> uh, we waited for her down the road and out of sight. It was a few days before the 4th of July and a gray, scrawny um, Italian child was setting torpedoes in a row along the railroad trail track. Terrible place, isn't it? said Tom, exchanging a frown with Dr. Eckelberg. Awful. So they're talking about the Valley of Ashes. So I wrote that in the um, margin so I remember. It does her good to get away. Doesn't her husband object? Wilson? He thinks she goes to see her sister in New York. He's so dumb, he doesn't even know he's alive. So that's good, um, a description of um, George Wilson. I put that in that margin that of Tom that he says of George. Not nice at all. So Tom Buchanan and his girl and I went up together to New York, or not quite together, for Mrs. Wilson sat discreetly in another car. Tom deferred that much to the sensibilities of those East Eggers who might be on the train. She had changed the dress, her dress from a brown figured muslin, which stretched tight over her rather wide hips, as Tom helped her to the platform in New York. At the newsstand, she bought a copy of Town Tattle and a moving picture magazine, and in the station drugstore, some cold cream and a small flask of perfume. Upstairs in the solemn echoing drive, she let four taxi cabs drive away before she selected a new one, lavender colored with gray upholstery. And in this, we slid out of the mass of the station into the glowing sunshine. Now, already she's acting like she's part of the wealthy, right? She goes in there and just buys things. And she, the first three taxis, they're not good enough for her. She's not paying for it, right? Tom's paying for all of this. So suddenly her whole demeanor and her whole character changes because she's with Tom. So she's part of the elite and she can just, you know, throw his money around. And of course he's doing it. I mean, he's getting some reward, I guess. Um, but just the fact that she, literally she lives over a garage, yet she's telling these taxis that they're not good enough. You know, I, I need a new one. Okay. Um, but immediately she turned sharply from the window and leaning forward, tapped on the front glass. I want to get one of those dogs, she said earnestly. I want to get one for the apartment. They're so nice to have a dog. We backed up to a gray old man who bore an absurd resemblance to John D. Rockefeller. In a basket swung from his neck, cowered a dozen very recent puppies of an indeterminate breed. And what is indeterminate breed? Basically, they're mutts, okay? They're, but you don't know what breed they are. And so they just, um, they're not worth, you know, a lot of money and how people pay for like purebred dogs. They're just mutts. What kind are they? Asked Miss Wilson eagerly as um, he came to the taxi window. Uh, all kinds. What kind do you want, lady? Um, I'd like to get one of those uh, police dogs. I don't suppose you've got that kind. The man peered doubtfully into the basket, plunged his hand in and drew one up, wiggling by the back of his neck. That's no police dog, said Tom. No, it's not exactly a police dog, said the man with uh, disappointment in his voice. It's, it's more of an Airedale. He passed his hand over the brown wash rag of a back. Look at that coat, some coat. That's a dog that'll never bother you with catching a cold. I think it's cute, said Miss Wilson enthusiastically. How much is it? That dog? He looked at it admiringly. That dog will cost you uh, $10. The Airedale. Undoubtedly, there was an Airedale concerned in it somewhere, though its feet were startling white. Changed hands and settled down into Mrs. Wilson's lap, where she fondled the weatherproof coat with rapture. Okay. I'm not familiar with an Airedale, but it's 
the way Nick is describing it, clearly it's not an Airedale. Maybe it had like, you know, one sixteenth Airedale in it somewhere, but you can tell Miss Wilson doesn't know the difference. Okay. He could have told her it's a Dalmatian and cause she doesn't know she's not of this higher upper class who understands, you know, different, um, different breeds. Um, is it a boy or a girl? She asked delicately. That dog, uh, that dog's a boy. It's a bitch, said Tom decisively. Here's your money. Go and buy 10 more dogs with it. So Tom does know something about breeding, okay? And later, I mean, we're talking about dogs now, but it's gonna come about with people, okay? He is from a, um, a class that's a little, you know, that's higher than her and them know that it's a girl. Okay. He didn't even like look at it. And so you can just tell and definitely not, he should not have paid $10 for it, but this shows that Tom has money to throw away. And if Miss Wilson wants it, she gets it. Okay. We drove over to fifth Avenue. So warm and soft, almost pastoral on a summer Sunday afternoon that I wouldn't have been surprised to see a great flock of white sheep turn the corner. Hold on. I said, I have to leave you here. No, you don't imposed Tom quickly. Myrtle will be hurt if you don't come up to the apartment, won't you, Myrtle? Come on, she urged. I'll telephone my sister, Catherine. She's said to be very beautiful by people who ought to know. Well, I'd like to, but we went on, cutting back again over the park toward the West Hundreds. At 158th Street, the cab stopped at a slice of, long, of a long white cake of apartment houses. Throwing a regal homecoming glance around the neighborhood, Miss Wilson gathered up her dog and her purchases and went haughtily in. Okay, so if someone is acting haughtily, they're acting like they're they're too good for everybody. This is the girl that lives above an apartment. Okay, I'm sorry, her apartment is above a garage. So she doesn't have any right to be acting this way. But as soon as she is with Tom, she goes up. He's literally rented this apartment for them to um, probably play like board games in. Um, no, this is where they, they meet and they have their affair. And so she just becomes um, this other person that I guess she wishes she was. And so she gets home and or home and she, you know, grabs the dog and grabs all of her stuff and just kind of like walks in, you know, like she is, you know, just born into into wealth. OK. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced when we, um, when, sorry, I'm going to start over because I can't see this. I'm going to have the McKees come up, she announced as we rode up the elevator. And of course, I've got to call it my sister too. And that is the end of part two. So um, if you've read it along with me, you can now um, answer those questions. And hopefully I have, if you've listened to me as I've gone along and, and you've marked things, hopefully your questions have been answered. Um, stay tuned for part three.